So, hello everyone. My name is Rohan. I am from, I am an undergraduate at RD Kanpur in India. My talk's title is to be precise, regression aware debugging. My co-authors are Avnish Pandey and Subhajit Roy, who is also here with us. So, let's get started. So, introduction to bug localization. So, we all know that debugging is a very hard activity and we would like to develop tools that assist the developer in actually pinpointing the fault. So, bug localization. In bug localization, we have a buggy program, right? And we have a test suite. <coughs> the test suite can contain input-output pairs or input assertion pairs, and it also contains a failing test uh, as to, uh, so that we could actually find that the code was buggy in the first place. These two are given as an input to a localizer, and what the output is, a set of suspicious program locations, yeah? And why could this help us? We don't really need to inspect the entire code to search for the fault. What we can do is restrict ourselves to this small set of suspicious locations. So thereby decreasing the developer and effort that needs to be involved, yeah? So what is a good bug, bug localization? The set of suspicious locations should be small with respect to the overall code. So the developer doesn't have to go through too many locations to find the fault. That would be really good if the actual fix was in this particular set. So the developer actually finds the fix he was looking for. Yeah. So let's look at a technique which was used using partial maxi for bug localization. So what is partial maxi? So you're given a CNF formula, right? And you can partition the clauses into two classes. One is a hard clauses, the other is the soft clauses. What we mean is that in hard clauses, they cannot be relaxed. By relaxed, I mean that they cannot be removed from the entire formula. Similarly, soft clauses can actually be relaxed. And the, our query is that what are the minimum number of clauses that need to be relaxed or removed so that we can get a satisfiable formula? So if the formula was originally satisfiable, this number will be zero, right? So this was incorporated in bug assist a tool by Joe et al. in PLDI 2011. <coughs> so consider this particular program. The input is that the variable C is zero. The output is that the variable A needs to be true. Uh, we all know that a program can be expressed in uh, as a logical formula, but I'll stick to this particular notation for convenience, right? So we can see that this is a buggy test case. For input uh, C, which is zero, we actually get the output is minus one, right? So let's see how, uh, and in this case, if we actually relax a particular statement, what we mean is, uh, say we relax the statement A equals to A plus one. What we're doing is we are disregarding the RHS, we throw away A plus one, and what we do is we can assign any random value to A, right? So what, uh, so we use partial max set on this particular problem, we make the input and output constraints as hard. We cannot relax them which means that we cannot modify them. It would be stupid to modify the input output, right? But we make the program statements themselves as soft. We can actually make modification in them. So after giving it to a partial max out solver, we get the answer as one. So, and it says that the first particular statement can actually be relaxed. Now let's see how it actually produced this. It just changed A equals to zero to A equals to three, and then the program started passing. But we, uh, there might be some other solutions to this problem as well. So what we do is, we make the uh, statement which was found earlier as hard, so we cannot modify this anymore, and we give, uh, uh, give it to the solver again. And this time it returns a equals to a minus one. It says that you replace it by a equals to two. You give a concrete random value, such that the program starts passing now, right? So what bug assist does is it reports these two particular uh, expressions as uh, suspicious program locations, right? So bug assist in summary outputs the minimum number of uh, relaxed statements to fix the failing test. So you in some sense making the least number of modifications pro to the program to actually fix the test, right? This output's relatively small, but it's still kind of large, a set of suspicious locations. So it's around uh, 15 to 20 for 100 lines of code program, right? The question is, can we do better? The thing to note is that no suspicious locations are created equal, right? For bug assist, it just looks at that failing test. So all the locations it gets can actually fix the failing test. But what about the passing test? We're disregarding crucial information in that case, yeah? 
can we reasonably predict whether any change at a particular location is likely to cause regression, okay? even if it fixes the failing test. So intuition is that since we are relaxing a statement, instead of assigning a random value, can we have some much more, uh, much more information as to how we pick that random value to pick the failing test, right? So what we do is we augment the suspicious program location with a suspiciousness score, which in this case is the regression score, right? This regression score indicates how hostile it is to passing tests, right? So the friendlier it is, the more viable for repair it is in some sense. So our contribution is a tool named Tintin. So what we do is we extract proofs of correctness from the uh, passing test, right? We add additional constraints, we call these roadblocks, that discourage modifications to the program using pa which partial max are did, that may damage this particular proof, right? These roadblocks are basically summaries of program execution for the passing test case, since we know they are correct. At various points, these various points are for us are just basic log boundaries in a particular program. And then we use Craig interpolation to gather these summaries. Now we perform max or partial max at on the new formula, the original formula plus the new roadblocks that we have. Yeah. And then compute the regression score from the partial max at result that we get. Right. So a sidetrack, just to introduce Craig interpolation to the ones who might not know in the audience. If we have a formula A and B, which is unsatisfiable, then I is a Craig interpolant of A and B if A implies I, I is a weaker form of A. I and B is still unsatisfiable, right? And I only contains free variables that are common to A and B. Since intuitively, this I summarizes the role of A in the unsatisfiability. It disregards all the useless parts. It just concentrates on the core of A that was responsible for unsatisfiability. Now to use this in a passing test case, we need an unsatisfiable formula. What we do is we negate the desired output condition. Let's see how this can be done. So we perform Craig interpolation on execution trace, not the actual program, yeah? So we strip away the previous uh, program and the input was that the variable C is now one and the output was that the variable A needs to be one. So we negate it. So the program along with these constraints is now unsatisfiable, right? Now suppose we want to compute an interpolant at the basic block after line three, right? So we now our A in A and B is A equals to zero and if C equals to one, the B part contains the input constraint, the output constraint, as well as A equals to A plus one. The reason why input was included in B is summarized in the paper. I don't have the time to go through it. So how, what is our regression score? So now the partial max at will return the minimum number of relaxed clauses, right? Now this is the number of relaxed statements plus the number of relaxed roadblocks, right? We denote these, these as NS and NR. Our regression score is now a function of NS and NR. This is up to you, right? But what uh, we denote regression score with is that lower is the score, the less likely it is for a change at this particular location to cause regression, right? And hence, it, the more suspicious it is, right? It's more viable for repair. So you can take F as simply the sum of these two. So if you're uh, relaxing less roadblocks and less statements, you're getting a much more viable location for repair. So let's look, uh, dive straight into a motivating example. We take, uh, we borrow a program from the TCAS benchmarks, which is part of the Siemens test suite. This is created by, uh, by researchers by artificially injecting faults to create 40 different buggy versions. That this is relatively small, around 100 to 150 lines of code. Yeah. So we specifically take version six of TCAS. I strip, a, I have stripped away uh, the unnecessary functions, but the code is still pretty large. So I'd like you to focus your attention on the function own below track, right? So it returns whether own tracked altitude was less than or equals to un other tracked altitude, right? The bug lies in the less than or equals. We actually needed just a less than, right? So if you notice the uh, failing test, uh, the func this function will return incorrect values when these two variables are actually equal. We needed a false, but it's returning true, right? So we take uh, such a failing test case, which has this particular constraint, and we see how buggers it performs. These gray grayed out statements belong to that uh, set of suspicious locations that buggers is reports. So uh, for example, you can see that this upward preferred 
line, the computation of up upward preferred is actually seen as a suspicious location. And the, the solver just says that you flip the value of upward preferred so that it starts taking the else part or the if part depending on what the behavior of the failing test case was. And that can repair the program apparently. But it doesn't take into account what, uh, what it might do to a passing test case, right? So let's see how our tool Tintin performs. So bug assist reported 11 locations, right? We report just five. And these five does contain the actual uh, bug location. Hang on, yeah. So how was this achieved by our tool? So we take a set of passing test cases. I have truncated them, just the relevant variables. There are many more input variables, but I'm not tracking them. Uh, note that this output, which is shown there, is actually the output of the entire program, not the function itself, right? So because of the first test case, the intercoolant which was obtained right after the return statement was that if own tracked altitude is greater than other tracked altitude, I necessarily need to return zero for the passing test cases to remain correct. And from the second test case, we could obtain that if it's less than, I need to return a one. It didn't talk about the case when they, those two are equal, right? And that's why uh, the solver simply flipped the value from true to false and it still passed both these roadblocks because it didn't uh, restrict uh, the value when the case was that the two variables are equal, right? Similarly, for other cases, this was not the case. Uh, these intercoolants actually blocked the value that the solver was looking for and hence these were ranked low by a two. Note that uh, these five locations that we have shown here are not the only suggestions, but these are the top ranked locations with the highest suspiciousness score, right? There are other suggestions, but they're ranked pretty low. And a developer would like to s look at a set of locations which are ranked high first, yeah? Uh, so another side comment that would I would like to make is that if the solver does break some roadblocks, does violate them, it doesn't really mean that we, uh, the, a fix at that particular location will necessarily induce regression, okay? This is just a prediction that we're making. And this can be due to a number of reasons such as the intercoolants that we're computing are not general enough. So it doesn't allow certain MaxArt, uh, so certain values produced by the MaxArt solver, when in fact it could actually uh, fix the failing test case as well as the passing test case, right? Uh, this is, of course, described much more in detail in the paper. I encourage you to go through it. A quick slide about the implementation. We built this, built Tintin on top of the CVMC model checker by Clark et al. So CVMC acts as a front end. It can take a C program as an input. It converts it into a logical formula and our work steps in. We use MathSat for interpolation and we use MS Uncore for partial MathSat, right? And this was also used by Bug Assist in their evaluation. So our first research question is, does regression awareness actually improve the results for bug localization? We split this into two parts. One is with respect to the ground truth location or repair. So as I said, TCAS, uh, as an example, <coughs> had researchers injecting faults. So we really know what the repair is, the actual repair is, right? So we evaluate first with respect to that. The other is with respect to all repairable locations. I'll get to this. And the second research question is, how much does regression awareness cost us, right, in terms of clauses and the solving time? So uh, first part of the first research question, with respect to the ground truth location, right? So a few assumptions and methodology that was followed. We assume the developer goes in decreasing order of suspiciousness. So just to remind you, uh, we output a set of locations augmented with a regression score, right? So the developer will look at first look at locations which were ranked higher or more suspicious by a tool, right? For re-bug assist, uh, the re is because we re-implemented bug assist. Uh, their tool wasn't really working properly. And for them, the score is one for every location because it doesn't distinguish between uh, uh, two different suspicious locations, right? So in fact, it's just random ordering. The developer is free to follow any order uh, in that set of suspicious locations while evaluating them, right? For Tintin, random ordering is just between locations with equal score. So if two locations have the same regression score, uh, the developer is uh, free to pick any one of them, right? First. 
and representative set of passing tests is used to prevent blow up. So for TCAS, say you have around 1000 passing test cases. So if you use all of them, you extract interpolants from all of them, your formula is going to uh, grow quite large. So we use a representative set using code coverage and uh, related metrics. So we bring it down to say 10 or 20. So we measure quality by the number of locations that were required to be examined by the developer before reaching the ground truth location, right? So this in some sense captures the amount of developer e effort involved and safety, right? So these are the results. So let me explain what worst case and average case are. So the worst case indicates the situation where the developer finds the uh, fix, actual ground truth fix, at the very end of the ordering. So he say he was very unlucky in going through that particular set and he found it at the last. And the average case, it's just a statistical average, he'll find it around the middle, right? So, and we pick three kinds of benchmarks. One is TCAS, it's uh, small enough, 100 to, 100 to 150 lines of code, but we model the entire thing, right? For larger programs, uh, modeling the entire program is uh, unfeasible. So we use model reduction techniques such as concolic execution, right? For SVComp and Cascade, the programs are small, but we didn't have test cases with us. We use some automatic gender test generation tool, right, CLI or something like that. And then we ran our tool on it, right? So the results are over here. So the say for the first guy, uh, TCAS 39% means that the developer was, uh, had to examine 39% less locations in order to get to that ground truth location, right? So third developer effort was saved by 39%. The second part of the particular question is with respect to all the repairable locations. So the idea here is that for a given set of passing tests and a failing test under its inspection, the ground truth might not be the only viable repair, right? Many possible locations where repairs can be introduced without causing regression. It will uh, be okay for all the passing tests and it will fix the failing test as well. You might be biased towards the ground truth because you already know it, but in a realistic setting, there might be many repairs possible. But, and does our algorithm rank most of these locations high? Then, then ca it can actually imply that our tool does rank repairs higher, right? So for this, we use a recent state-of-the-art repair tool, Angelix, Mektaev et al, XC60, to generate repairs. Why I've mentioned approximation is that even if a repair exists, it might not be able to find it. But if it does, it will, figure, it will be okay for all the passing tests as well as the failing test, right? Two configurations, all possible grammars. By grammars, I mean classes of repairs, right? So all possible grammars is the strongest setting. It can search for a huge repair location space. And we have a timeout of 20 minutes. Small grammars, no timeout. Small grammars, this includes the common errors that may be found in real programs. And a key thing to note here is all passing tests are used, around 1,000, okay? So it should work for the entire set of passing test cases. While Tintin still works on that representative set, right? Now we plot the rankings. So there's a lot in this graph. Let me break it down for you. So the green bars represent the size of the set of suspicious locations that were produced. That y-axis is the rank, right? So the crosses, uh, the height of the crosses indicate uh, how it is ranked by our tool in that particular ordering, right? So, so the lower the height is, uh, the more suspicious it is ranked by our tool, right? So the key statistic to note here is that 75% of the crosses lie below the 60% mark. So the 60% mark that you see indicate, uh, so the, all the crosses lying below that line are in the top 60% of our uh, suspicious location. So they are ranked very highly by our tool, right? So the thing to take away from this graph is that yes, repairable locations are being ranked pretty suspicious by our tool, right? The research question two is the overhead, how much does this cost us? So for TCAS, the formula blow up is around 1.3 times and the slowdown is around 4.5. So we actually didn't just explore program, uh, bug localization, we actually ex uh, also explored uh, bug repair uh, with Tintin. So the idea is that I'm lazy, I don't want, I don't want localizations, I want repairs. 
right? So we uh, implemented redirect fix, which is based on the direct fix algorithm by Mekta et al. in uh, 15. We, however, restrict it to common classes, uh, very simple classes of repairs, which is off by one or say re incorrect relational operators, incorrect logical operators, right? And then what uh, the algorithm does is it employs a SAT, uh, SMT solver for searching through the mutation space to find a repair which fixes all the tests, right? And we are guaranteed regression freedom in this case for the set of passing test cases you used, okay? How the formula can blow up? The way the algorithm achieves this is it, if you have n tests, it will create n copies of the entire program as a logical formula, take a conjunction, and then try to find a solution. So as you increase the number of tests, the formula uh, blows up pretty quickly. The, what we thought was why not use regression awareness in this setting? So with Tintin, we make a compromise. We don't guarantee regression freedom but we deal with smaller formulas and potentially faster solving times. So now our repairs that we generate are not guaranteed to uh, uh, be okay for all the passing tests, but we augment it with a regression score. And if that score is low, we hope that it uh, fixes all the passing tests as well as the failing tests, right? This is uh, what we hope. What we do is we use interpolants as preconditions and post conditions for the statement under consideration using that uh, grammar class of repairs. So an example is given here. So suppose the expression you wanted to fix was A times B, right? So now the choices indicate that application of a grammar rule. It says that the time, uh, the times operator can be replaced by a plus or a minus and so on, right? So the SMT solver will choose a particular value of choice so that it can fix the program. The preconditions and postconditions obtained by interpolation are that A is greater than B, and all I want is that selection at the end should be greater than zero, right? So what were the results? So the first research question we answer is that does using regression awareness instead of regression freedom actually downgrade, uh, degrade the results, right? Are we compromising too much? We found that the ground truth repair, the actual repair, right, was ranked the highest in more than 70% of the programs in our experiment. So they're not compromising too much. The quality is still good, right? But what is the impact on formula size and solving time? Why we are even doing this? Reduction was around 43% on formula sizes. And we attained speed ups between 1.3 to 6.5x, right? So in summary, we have presented a novel technique of using Craig interpolants as summaries of passing tests to improve bug localization. We do not disregard the passing test as bug assist does. And we suggest a potential application of using interpolants to you know, speed up program repair without compromising too much on quality, right? Thank you, and uh, like some questions.